Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Chiam, and I'm Assistant Professor of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Western Carolina University. Our course of business focuses on providing high quality education to prepare business ready graduate. I believe earning certification is a great value and benefit for students. The International Hospitality Institute offers many great training and certification to hospitality professionals and students. I went through the Certified mm -hmm. Hotel General Manager Certification and Certified Digital Marketing Director Certification. This program is online and self-paced. They are informative courses. I would recommend this program to hospitality professionals and students who are looking to upscale or reskill themselves in the field of hospitality. Thank you, International Hospitality Institute, for the great certifications. That's brilliant. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Labor Crisis panel here at the Global Hospitality Summit. I'm absolutely thrilled to be moderating this panel. I'm Sanjana Chapali, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at GoMoment. Um, we're a hospitality technology company based in uh, LA and functioning out of North America primarily. Thrilled to have two amazing gentlemen who I've known and I've spoken with repeatedly in the past, Dr. Peter Ritchie and Dr. Altaf Savani. Um, I can attempt, to, attempt an introduction, but I'd love for you to give us more details. Peter, I can start with you. Do you want to introduce yourself better for us? Sure. I'm Peter Ritchie. I run the hospitality and tourism program at Florida Atlantic University. It's in Boca Raton in South Florida. And uh, the reason I'm kind of here is that we had a certificate during COVID um, that went viral and had over 80,000 people go through it. So we were a starting point for the labor crisis conversation and kind of saw it coming along. Um, I'm a long-term industry guy. I've been in the business since the age of 14, hotels, restaurants, and destination marketing. And then I went into academia later in my career. So it's great to be here with you. Nice to see you, Sanjana. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm sure I have a lot more questions to dive into, but let me go off and across to Altaf. And Altaf, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Sajana. It's a pleasure to be here, first of all. Um, I have been in the academia world as an academic leader in the post-secondary institutions and as an entrepreneurial and as a hospitality consultant. I ran the uh, School of Hospitality and Tourism at Algonquin College here in Canada for the last uh, 25 years. Um, I, have, uh, uh, I have been a restauranter uh, in my previous life too, so I uh, got a lot of experience in the restaurant industry. Uh, my recent research uh, was in uh, um, human capital, where we talked about job satisfaction and job retention of millennials in the Canadian hotel industry. Right. Thank you, Alta. Thank you for that. You know, the reason I'm absolutely thrilled to be here is one, because of the perspectives that you gentlemen bring into the panel, but also because of your deep engagement with the industry. I mean, Peter, you, you talk about starting in the industry when you were 14 and continuing all the way down to now. And Alta, you've also talked about wearing different hats before being an academic. And that makes it really interesting for me to dive in and to hear your perspectives. I think I want to start with asking a very basic question, given the, the, the title of the panel, you know, we're talking about the labor crisis and, you know, trying to find practical solutions. And I wonder whether we're defining the problem correctly, because on one hand, we are talking about, you know, having too many jobs and not enough people applying for them. On the other hand, when I'm looking at the statistics from the U.S. Labor Office, there are millions of people who are currently unemployed. So are we defining the problem here correctly? There seems to be a mismatch from my perspective. I think originally we felt that people were leaving in mass. Now we've realized that across all industries, there are many people who have just not decided not to come to back to work, period. So they don't appear in any numbers or metrics. They're just not there. So combine that with the shortage of labor and we have a big problem because, um, you know, there are still people who are doing caregiving. There's still people who have COVID shock. There's still people who don't want to work in services any longer, who want to do something from home. So altogether, it's, it is a big void. It's, it's a tremendous void. So I think we're calling it 
in defining it correctly. We just don't know how to get our arms around it yet. And, you know, today I, I hope we talk about what I'm seeing as some small attempts at getting there. Um, there was an article in Business Insider today, and it was the first time I saw two of the hotel CEOs actually say and comment that, yes, we have to get our arms around it. We have to do something. It was uh, Marriott and uh, Best Western. So that, that's a start. Uh, right now, you know, in my part of the world, we're super busy. We're not in high season yet, but we're busier than we normally are in high season. And it looks like it's just going to stay that way. Uh, so we do right. have a, a labor pandemic, you know? Right. And Peter, do you want to tell us a little bit, um, um, before I go off to you, Alta, do you want to tell us a little bit of where you are and where you're seeing the action? Because I'm not sure everybody understands. Sure. I'm in uh, the southern portion of Florida, the United States, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach. And our state fared better during the pandemic because our governor was one of the early opener uh, models. Mm -hmm. And we also simultaneously promoted Florida through Visit Florida as an outdoor destination. So people started feeling a little safer to travel in the state, doing in-state travel, as well as people coming from the neighboring states. So we fared a little better throughout. And then more recently in the past three to six months, we've just been busy with domestic travel. You know, as right. of yesterday, the international borders open. So we're expecting even a more influx over the next 90 days. I, I'd love to understand what would happen when high season comes around, Peter, when if this is the situation right now. But sure. let me ask you, Altaf, what is the problem that we have on hand? Is it a shortage of labor? Is it a labor crisis? Are we defining it correctly? How, how do you see this? Yeah, so I think um, um, we need to dig deeper and hopefully we can do today. Uh, the pandemic has changed the whole norm of the industry, right? So even after the pandemic is over, I don't think we'll ever get to the normalcy of what we had in 2019, <laughs> let's say. So it'll be a whole new world coming to up there. But just to give you an example from my point of view where I am in my part of the world, we had 10,000 restaurants close during pandemic. We had 800,000 jobs either lost, uh, laid off or furloughed. And some of them are not coming back. So Peter is right, uh, you know, in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, it's different situation. But up here, I would say some of them were really uh, subsidized by the government by giving them the EI, employment insurance and, and CERB and all that stuff. So that kind of kept them up there that you were getting $2,000 a month. Why do I need to go and get there? Probably they make more money getting $2,000 than actually going and fighting for the tips. So that was one thing. The other thing was that, you know, a lot of them were single parents, you know, and because things were opening and closing, opening and closing, um, you know, the babysitting, the schools were closed. So, you know, the kids were at home doing online learning and doing everything online. So that kind of caused that up there. But yeah, there is, then we have the overall thing, which is the branding and image issue we have in our industry. Uh, you know, low paid industry, long hours, not flexible scheduling and all that. And, you know, the, the, the models of management is still tied to the baby boomer generation. So if you look at that, plus people are saying, if I go back to work, um, there is client behavior patterns have changed, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the customers have been cooked up too long for two, two years that you know, their demands are a little different. And so why do I want to go and work and put up with that? You know, so that's another area I think uh, we have to, to look at it. I, I, if I hear both of you correctly, what I'm hearing is essentially that there are other reasons which are not being tracked correctly for people not coming back into the hospitality industry jobs, you know, whether it's um, the economy not opening up completely or whether life not going back into normal with regard to schools and education, babysitting and all of the caregiving that needs to happen. That comforts me to some extent because it means that people want to come back into our industry. You know, people want to come back at some point to the hospitality industry. Um, is that what you're hearing as well, Peter? Or is that something that you're, the, you don't agree with? 
you know, the majority of the certificate takers, um, were, there's a, it's a mixed bag. There are people who felt very betrayed by the industry during COVID because they had given their lives to it and then they were abruptly stopped. But there really was nothing else the employers could have done at that point. We all just stopped in our tracks. Um, more recently, we did a survey and about a third of the people in the survey were actively looking outside the industry if they were currently working in it. And I went to the Florida Governor's Conference and there was a presentation on locals' perception of tourism around the state. And one disturbing thing to me was that the younger people were much more anti-tourism than the middle and the older group. So if that's a sentiment among young people that we don't really like tourism as an entity in our community, they're also feeling they don't wanna work in it. And I've noticed among students that their parents who lost their jobs during COVID, uh, it's probably was a common household conversation every day or every other day. So the students have a fear of, should I work in this? Will I be furloughed too? Um, and so on. So it, it, it's a combination of people finding that they want more out of life and they want more time with family and friends and they want more flexibility. In our industry, you know, it's been plagued with a low pay, long hours reputation since its inception. I disagree that that's accurate once you move beyond entry level, but that is the perception. So it just added fuel to the fire during COVID because now young individuals that are exploring careers are like, well, that's the one where everyone got laid off and they work all weekends and nights. I don't want to do that. So we mm -hmm. definitely have a perception issue that was heightened because of, of COVID. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you're going to ask a question on what we're doing, but that's kind of the perception. I feel that we have a long-term issue. We've always had a problem recruiting sufficiently. And now I think that is going to stay heightened for quite a while. I, I like that you're talking about this being a long-term issue, and this isn't something that we're seeing. We're probably seeing it more magnified right now, but that this has always been part of our industry before. Also, have you talked about this as well briefly when you were talking about how uh, we need to cater differently to baby boomers? And I was wondering if you can throw some more color into that, you know, define sure. for us also who you think is baby boomers, because I think those definitions are also things that, yeah, that aren't yeah. very clear. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's uh, um, it's a fact that, you know, like this is the first time in the history that we are seeing four generations of people working in the in, in our industry. So you have the generations X, Y, and Z, and then you have the baby boomers. They're all working in the industry. But the, the part that's, that's where, where the governments and the industry has to really focus on is that today we have 40% of our workforce is actually millennial. And by 2025, which is just round the corner, it will just come really fast. That percentage is gonna be changed to 75% of our global workforce is gonna be millennials. So yes, what does that mean? Well, that means that the way we are recruiting people, uh, the way we are compensating them, uh, you know, the way we are giving benefits, uh, the way we are training them and treating them, uh, the supervisors have to treat them a little bit differently because they have their wants and needs are different than what the, 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 the my generation as a baby boomer was that, you know, yeah, please hire me as a dishwasher and I'll be faithful to you as long as in 20 years you make me a general manager, right? And you're dealing with the baby boomers here where they're not going to stand for that. So, yes. There is that part up there too. And the other part is that um, the 15 to 24 year old uh, are declining in the age too right now. So mm -hmm. if you look at that in Canada, for example, we have 240,000 people are gonna be short because by 2025, we won't have that age group. We'll be low 
to 240,000. Sure. So there adds again uh, in our industry where you already were short even before the pandemic, now you're gonna be more short. So that's, I think that's the whole strategy that the industry will have to come up with that, you know, how do we manage these four generations of people? And right. the interesting part was that when I did my last research and I was talking to the VPs of hotel companies like Marriott's and Accor and Hilton, um, not to mention which, which, which VP, but one of them uh, I asked that, you know, are you doing anything for the baby boomers? Uh, and he says, no, we are just too busy uh, merging all these brands, 20 brands, 30 <laughs> brands. We are worried about the culture rather than who we are hiring. We just need a fresh body coming in there and we're going to hire them. But whereas yeah. there's an issue there, which they know that, but mm -hmm. right now, because the brands have grown so big, as you can see, you know, you have right. 30 brands for Marriott. I mean, you can't even fit that on a letterhead, but, you know, forget about all the cultures. And now you have this issue up there, right? So I think that yeah. industry will have to come. I'm, I'm going to hold on to that uh, thought there, Alta, because I think there's, there's some, some more detail I think we'd, I'd like to go into when it comes to the culture as well as the perception. Both of you talked about how there is a perception of our industry being uh, one that's fatigued by low wages and long hours. So I'm going to hold on to that. And I just want to talk to you, Peter, right now about the point that Altaf is raising. Do you think we need a different recruitment approach for the industry absolutely, at this absolutely, point? Absolutely. I think um, one of the steps that I've seen the industry take for the first time is to already increase living wage at the entry level. They've tried desperately, quickly to make a change. All right, so that's one step, is that we will no longer be the, the lowest paying of the choices for young people um, so that they can we can compare evenly with other fields. Now, what I've noticed on the back end is companies have done that right away so that they can stay afloat and try to get as many associates as they can on board. But on the back end, the furloughed seasoned people are not being invited back to their higher level roles, or if they are, they've been offered lower salaries or bigger roles for the same money. So it seems that at the macro level, the, the CEOs and strategists are like, okay, we need to put the money up front or we won't have any staff. So let's raise our starting wage from 12 to 18 or 15 to 20 or whatever it is in, what, in the country or area you are that step took place, that's gonna hit the bottom line. So in the meantime, let's not hire back on the back end until we know where we are. Um, you know, so we're taking some creative steps. The other things I've noticed, hotels are moving in some cases to a three-day work week if they can figure out how. Um, any positions in restaurants, hotels, catering that can be work from home, they're letting that become a partial normal reality, whereas before it was not even consideration. But again, we have that stigma of we, when, if you work in operations, if you have to be in the theme park or on board the ship, you can't work from home. So the only way to build in some semblance of work-life balance, which is the biggest request besides a better living wage, is to come up with something creative. So I've seen, um, like I said, shorter work weeks, longer days. Uh, we've seen role swapping. We've seen a couple of hotels where they've permitted staff to make their own schedules so that mm -hmm. they could work four days and then take the next week off and then work a six day stretch or whatever, whatever is more accommodating. Um, when I right. entered as a young person, that was not an option. Like I'll have said, you, you were told, here's your position, you're a server, you're a busser, you're a front desk agent, you were thankful, you worked as many hours as you were told, and you waited for your promotion. <laughs> so now it's got to be put into the hands of the individuals. They want to create their careers. They don't want us dictating the set schedules and the way we've done business all the, way, all the time in the past. So that's interesting. So we're not talking just about a different recruitment approach, but we're just talking about a different approach to how we craft the the work itself and how we shape, you know, the the conditions at work. I'm curious though, 
and I'll you know come to both of you. When I'm talking to general managers or when I'm talking to people who are recruiting the HR people, I hear so many stories of people applying for jobs, you know, people having confirmed interviews and then simply not showing up you know, to those interviews and you're simply not accepting the, the job offers once they have been made. And I wonder then, because at that point, people would have found out about the wages that they're being offered. You know, people would have had a chance at negotiating at the job offer stage, they would have had a chance at negotiating how many hours they want to work, um, you know, on a shift. And yet when it comes to joining day, people not showing up seems to reflect that we need to still talk deeper and talk, dig deeper into what the problem is. Why do you think that's happening? And I'm gonna to come to you, Peter, first. This, uh, this issue across HR is very prevalent in my daily activities because I post thousand jobs a week almost for our employer mm -hmm. constituents. Um, you know, uh, applicants are ghosting the interviews um, initially some even after the offer just walk away and don't reply. And you know, this is banter on LinkedIn regularly for me. And the only thing I can attribute it to among, and I don't want to um, bash any specific age group, but people who have grown up using technology more than interpersonal communications, they've had the ability on social media to have confrontations and then to block other people. So I've surveyed some of our students and alumni and a lot of them feel that it is confrontational to have that discussion that you're no longer interested or that it's not the right job for you. So instead of saying, Sanjan, I'm so sorry, I found something at here instead of there, they just go away. And their answer is, right. you know, well, wouldn't they assume I'm not interested if I went away? And then, of course, as educators, we try to infuse that's irresponsible, <laughs> that's not professional. But in a generation where you can simply block someone that you don't like what they're saying or their politics or their videos, that's the world they live in. So in a way, they're just like blocking that employer out and not remembering the bigger repercussions because that employer may very well remember you or they, the recruiter might move to the next company you're applying to. So it's not smart, but it's happening everywhere in the industry. I think it's also a lost opportunity when it comes to negotiation skills, Peter, because you know absolutely there is an opportunity there for people to come back into that particular interview setting or you know that conversation with the employer to talk about what they're not happy with and how they absolutely. want to improve it you know, and come back with solutions to say, I don't like this, this is what I'd prefer instead. And how do we go from there? So there is there is definitely a lost opportunity that I see when it comes to negotiation skills and trying to improve that. But let me ask you, Altaf, you know, what do you think of this whole ghosting situation that we're seeing, not just at the application stage, but also further down the line when people have to just turn up on, on joining day? Yeah, and, and it's, it's, in, it's interesting what Peter said uh, is, um, uh, when I was in the academia world, well, it was happening the same thing. You have recruiters coming right at the school. They actually go into the classroom. They pick up the people and then interviews are, are, are held and they don't go there. And, you know, so that's the, I think that's the culture of the millennials uh, and, and, and I think Generation Z. But they, they expect competitive compensation. They want an enjoyable workplace, right? This is engaged. They have to be engaging. They have to be productive. So, you know, by they changing minds, they could flip their mind just like that and say, you know, I'm going to, uh, let's say, a, a Westin hotel. But, you know, they must have heard something from their other counterpart that maybe it's a, a Hilton is a better hotel. You know, and they would change their mind without letting anybody know, right? So that's, that's an issue, definitely. But uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I think, uh, we need to do a better job as supervisors and managers to understand this particular group. So more mm -hmm. effort is needed to place, I think, in the culture and the change management to address this issue. I mean, it's, it's a big issue. Um, the millennials don't want uh, supervisors to, to, to manage them like their parents. They already live with their parents, right? So there, there is that understanding of that culture um, in organizations where supervisors 
use millennials and they understand millennials, you know, their, their retention rate is much higher. Let's just face it, right? And, and Peter can see that uh, in Florida too. And in in, in, this, is, this is what's really happening. So compensation needs to be addressed as a long standing issue. We all agree on that. But I think the root of the problem is that to understand the culture of these people and how we are recruiting them to is very, very important too. Uh, we cannot recruit them with the same form that we used to recruit before. You need to use technology. You used to use social media. And those are, yeah. are the new things that we as supervisors and managers in the industry need to know that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that you've raised an important point there, Alta, that the fact that we have... You know, we have a problem with, with wages, we have a problem with culture, and these are things which need to be addressed at this particular point. Um, I, as a marketing person, right, I'm, I'm in the marketing space, and when I hear that we have a perception problem and we need to work on the perception issue, or we need to market ourselves better, I always feel like that's very, um, it, it's very untrue, you know, it's very false for us to go out there and to try and market something that isn't necessarily right for people who are coming into the industry or for the industry itself. So rather than talking about we need to market ourselves better and we need to move away from the perception that we are low wages, long hours kind of industry, I feel that we need to start talking about the solutions to the problem. You know, that there is a problem, let's acknowledge that. And then let's talk about the solutions to that. And Peter, you talked about some people coming forward now and acknowledging that there is, an, there is um, a crisis over here. Do you want to share more details about that? What is that conversation you are hearing? Sure. And I like the comment in the chat too, which is spot on. You know, people don't, don't quit the brand or the employer or the theme park. They quit their immediate boss. And um, right now their immediate bosses are so frazzled trying to keep the business alive and with short staffing that they're probably not being the best mentors, which isn't helping either, you know? So in terms of, um, you know, what's, what we're seeing is that it is a matter of money. You know, I like to look at the macro level because I, like I said, I started at age 14 and I'm 56 now. That's a long time. And, and in the 80s, we, you know, there was uh, tax law changes in the U.S. and companies couldn't entertain at the same level with a tax write-off. And then we had SARS and Zika in the 90s and then in 9-11 and this and that. And we've, every crisis we have, the industry tries to cut costs or become more efficient afterward as its solution to the problem. Um, along the way, we've also become a real estate investment type of business versus our core hospitality caregiver business. So you add in all those ingredients, and yes, the worker is kind of left to the side doing more and more and more within their 40 or 50 hour work week than they did the decade prior and the decade prior. So someone entering the business now will work harder, longer, and do many more tasks than someone who entered it in the 80s, 90s, or two, early 2000s. So it, it needs to be a relook at profit levels, a relook at robotics and AI and how it can be incorporated, and an immediate improvement on a living wage. You know, here in Florida, the big debate was about a $15 minimum wage. Then COVID came. And after COVID, that $15 is, is just a rather useless number. And I don't like using any one number because it depends on where you are in the world as to what a proper living wage is. So I would say a combination of raising wages at the start is a must. Giving the industry a better perception or a, a better campaign of we are a career path. We are not a place just to stop on the way to another job. That's one of our issues. We need better career pathing. I start in a restaurant here and then this is my step. Or I started a cruise line, these are my steps. Or I started an online travel agency, these are the steps. We've never done a good job at career pathing. Um, and I yeah. love what Alta have said about the young people not wanting to be managed at work by 
parents. They are very entrepreneurial. They are very independent and they want to be a part of solutions. They don't want to be thrust into a square box role, which was our standard. You do this for a year, you do this for two years, and then you move along. Mm -hmm. So I could talk about this forever, but I love looking at the macro level. And I have sure. seen after every crisis, after every decade, our knee jerk reaction was always cut staffing numbers, cut FTEs, full-time equivalents, and add more efficiency. Well, we've done that to the point where we've pissed off millions of workers that have just walked away and said, I don't want to deal with that anymore. Altab, let me come to you on the back of that. It's, uh, <laughs> where do you see? Yeah, I'm just smiling. I just remembered uh, when I was on the faculty at the University of Guelph and I had an assignment given to my MBS students in a group. And the question was, uh, how do you see tourism in 2020? <laughs> Trying to see some of those uh, things to read up there. And it was interesting, right? Nothing about pandemic, but, oh, we're going to go on the moon and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But getting to this is, so what needs to be done now? post-pandemic, right? And, and I think in my perspective, I think uh, there are four things we can look at it. So number one is uh, industry associations and the government needs to come together and collaborate and address actually what the root of the problem is. The second and let me is ask the, you that. Let me ask yeah. you that, Altaf. What do you, I mean, can you spend a minute to talk about the root of the problem as well? What do you think everybody needs to collaborate yeah, so, uh, so from, from, from an industry perspective, you say the industry, so let's say the hoteliers have to come up and say, what do we need to change past pandemic? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go and revisit and re-examine our hiring policies, right? That would be one of them. The other one would be, where do we go and train the supervisors who are managing, right? And so it was interesting when I was hearing our guest speaker today, uh, when when uh, this thing happened, Horst Schulz, and he said uh, he hates in his hotels at that time that people would come and you show them videos and you do everything and say, we are a team. And then you just hand them off to someone else and then that's it. And he said, that doesn't work like that. And I think we need to put proper policies in there, uh, proper guidelines and proper training for these department heads on how to handle this particular culture. So that would be one of them. Uh, the industry associations have to come together with academia, okay? And then that's the other, uh, other area. The academia has to come together and they might have to revisit their curriculum too, right? And, and uh, Peter might agree with that, you know? The curriculum needs to be re-examined and, and revisited on what are the new skills or learning outcomes that we need in, in, in the courses and the programs that we are offering in the 21st century, whether it was a post pandemic or not, but what is happening now? So in terms of like, I give you an example, uh, if you are changing your curriculum, what are the new competencies that we are going to need um, in the 21st century with this particular workforce and this kind of tourists who expect a lot, you know, their expectations are very high. They're very sanitary, safety, protocol oriented now. Uh, the, the airlines industry is gonna be looking at that too. Sure. So I think our curriculum needs to be revisited. And I am I'm a big believer that maybe what Peter was just saying, and I'm not quite um, uh, know about the whole gist about that certificate you're talking about, but micro credentials are gonna be coming very, very soon. People are not going to yeah. spend four years and two years and whatever to, to get uh, a basic thing. A micro-credential, a three-month, a four-month thing, you're in, out, whether it's supported, funded by the industry, or you're funded by somewhere else, but you're not spending that much time in there. So that, that's one thing. The other part is the governments have to come in together because we need their help to fund some of these internships, the co-ops, the experiential learning part of it. And so they are part of this solution too, that there is a labor crisis. So if we all come together and collaborate, I think that would make a little bit different. And the third one is that um, 
uh, the businesses, you know, technology will become a driver of success, right? So for many businesses, business will need to put aside money uh, in their operating budget towards the investment of technology. That is given, right? So I think that, uh, that I think the industry has to make up their mind and put it part of their operating budget that we are going to need to spend time in technology and AI and all that kind of stuff. So I think those are right. some of the things and, and uh, you know, the demographic shifts, which is, again, like I said, it's, we, we need to look at it and say, okay, who are the largest amount of people who are going to be working in our industry and are we ready for that? Right. I'm, uh, there's a question already here from the audience. And but before I go to that, I just wanted to add a, a fourth stakeholder, Altaf, and I wonder if we are not asking the people who we want to recruit into our industry exactly what they are looking for. You know, there's so much of talk of how we need a collaboration between government and hotels and industries, and I don't disagree with that. But I also feel like we need to invite the people back into the table for them to come forward and to tell us exactly what, what it is that they're, they're asking. And Peter, you do a lot of surveys right now. Have you done one on these lines to simply say, what is it that, that the industry can offer? Yeah, our, um, our research, and it ties into the one question we have, you know, very much people want respect, they want to feel valued, they want to have a voice at the table in how their jobs are designed, and how they deliver service. Um, you know, a piggyback on what Altov said, we need a professional organization, uh, basically a public relations campaign about who we are and what we are as an industry and why we're a good place to work. Um, you know, the benefits uh, are you can move anywhere in the world, you can move up super quick, you can earn great money once you, you move up. We, we forget those great pieces of hospitality. Right now, all you see is, I don't wanna work that many hours. I don't wanna work nights. Uh, you laid me off during furlough. It's all negative. We need to shift it to the positive and I think that, you know, the, here in the U.S., the Department of Commerce can get behind initiatives like apprenticeships and so on. Um, you know, one thing we haven't touched upon that is very disconcerting is across the globe, hospitality enrollments are going down and they have been steadily for a while. So if we already have a labor crisis now, what does this mean in 2025 and 2030? when there are fewer people entering. Um, so the micro-credentials, the, you know, the professional association certifications, all of those are what people want to do. And we saw that during the certificate. I mean, let me take 40 hours or 20 hours of content. Let me see if I connect with this and then what can I do with it? So, you know, the question here about loyalty programs for employees versus guests, that's all a matter of going to work for the right company because there are certain brands that do treat their associates far better in similar roles than other. So as, a, as an applicant or as an associate, I tell everyone to do their due diligence. Um, I just had you know two alumni hired the same week for two very large hotel companies. One's offer letter was full of accolades and what we can do for you as an associate and welcome to our culture. And the other one looked like he was signing a lease to rent an apartment and it wasn't <laughs> warm and welcoming. So, you know, do your homework as an associate because there are plenty of companies that will reward you and treat you as if you're in a loyalty program for your service. That's what hospitality was initially started as a, a concept and some right. still do that well, you know? So Asha, that's your answer. If you're looking for, for an insight into a loyalty program, it does exist out there. Just do your homework and you'd probably come across this. Um, Altaf, are you, are you also hearing acknowledgement from the industry that there is a problem and that they are stepping up to address the crisis? Yeah, and, and you, I hear that a lot up here. And, you know, again, there, there isn't enough bodies up there uh, to go and apply for it. But you know, what, what the research has said and the research that I did uh, right during the pandemic was that the things came out like loud and clear was job satisfaction, 
um, opportunities for ad advancement, uh, the baby boomer culture that they're not, uh, uh, they don't appreciate that, uh, communications, that we need more communications on what are we hired for, what are we doing, what is our schedule. Uh, training and development was big too. And mm -hmm. of course, compensation is, is there, but the appreciation of work-life balance, that becomes always that, you know, that no problem will work, but there has to be some work-life balance up there. And especially sure. now, we, we have gone through pandemic and if you believe it or not, a lot of these people who have worked in the industry um, is they have gone through all these mental health issues and through pandemics and what's going on in their families. And, you know, so they, they need to be treated a little bit and appreciated a little bit differently than what was uh, pre-pandemic, right? So that, yeah. that has to be taken in consideration by the industry. And I think uh, uh, to make the industry more appealing, and I know I have been in this industry since I was 12 years old, and I made a living and I enjoy the industry because I just love the hospitality industry. You know, you're welcoming somebody, you're giving a service, they're coming to your house. And I think um, Peter is bang on right that, you know, we, maybe we need a marketing company to come up and, you know, uh, explain our industry. You know, why, why do you need to work for the industry and what are the benefits yeah. and things like I'm, that? I'm just... I don't disagree, Alta, but I do think that the marketing and the PR campaign has to come once we've had the industry acknowledge there's a problem and come forward yes. with the steps that they are taking to actively, um, you know, show the career pathing that Peter was talking about, you know, to talk about the different recruitment practices that you're, you're discussing as well, Alta. So I don't know if we should have a PR campaign without that open acknowledgement from the industry that they need to do something different and this is what they're doing. And, you know, here's a roster of of um, things that they are going to change and that they are going to, to do differently from this moment on. It isn't even 2022, it isn't 2025, yeah. but just right now at this point going forward, what do we do? And then of course, you know, once we've got those embedded into the, into the organization, by all means, let's talk about and let's change the perception. But I wonder if we don't do that, if we don't follow that sequence, it's just going to backfire because for a yeah. long time, people have heard, oh, we are a family, we are a team you know, from, from the employers and that isn't the reality. So if we don't have those practices and if we don't have those, those changes initially, any marketing or PR campaign is really just going to be um, a negative one in the long run. But it's, it's, it's a good thing. We are all talking about it right now, right? The governments <laughs> are talking, the industry is talking, the employers are talking and we are talking as academia to what to do. So I think we are all talking. So the only thing is we have to come together and say, okay, what is the strategy? And let's go with that. We're one minute away from, from the close of the session. I just wanted to ask you very quickly in 30 seconds or less, maybe Peter, what do you have for 2022 for us? Where, where do you see us going? Well, I see business is fantastic. So that's good. Uh, at least in my small corner of geography, labor has improved in terms of the hotels and restaurants are less strapped than they were six months ago. It's not by any means good, but it's better. And I don't see demand going down. So that's all positive. So my goal, my positive note for closing is if you're a student right now, you have your pick of the litter in terms of jobs that you can find. They're everywhere, they're abundant, and they're paying better than they ever have before. Um, and I can't thank, you know, International Hospitality Institute enough for all it does with its training and certificates and for getting us involved. It's, uh, it's very much appreciated. I'll make sure that I, I leave my email in case anyone has a question after. But thank you very much for having me. All right, I'll have any closing yeah. thoughts. I want to follow this as well because I have, a, I have one too in terms yeah. of hope and wish list yeah. for 2022. Yeah, and I think uh, I think from my point of view, I think I see uh, a light through the tunnel. I think we all have learned a good lesson. Um, we have all been very, one thing we have all learned is that we can be very creative and innovative. Uh, that's what uh, the pandemic has shown us. And then how can we take this further and be more creative and more innovative with the use of technology and again, when you're recruiting people up there, maybe you want to 
you put them in different groups, the people who are good with technology, the people who are not good with technology, and, you know, front of the house, back of the house, whatever it is. And I think I see uh, 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 that there is positive things coming because sure. we will bounce back. We'll bounce back, definitely. We do that after every disaster. But uh, how do we do it? It will be different. I, I think, you know, for me, the two positives that I want to talk about when we're discussing the entire labor crisis is essentially one, the conversations that we're having about it. You know, we've talked repeatedly throughout these the session of how this isn't something that started with the pandemic. We've always had this problem and we've always had this crisis. The first response has always been to, to um, eliminate FTEs and, you know, to, to fire people. I'm glad we're discussing this. So next time there is a crisis that rolls around, this isn't going to be the knee-jerk response that we have. So I'm very glad for the conversation. And I think the second thing that I'd like to see more of in 2022, and I'm positive we will, is the tech adoption that um, you know the industry as such is turning towards. It's no longer a question of nice to have, but that is entirely shifting towards a must have, you know, to deal with the the crises on on hand. So I'm 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 quite positive about 2022 and going forward, and finding our way out of the labor crisis. But I have to say thank you. It's been a fascinating conversation. I know that if I started talking to you about your backgrounds. I would spend another 45 minutes, but um, very grateful for the opportunity to moderate this panel. And thank you for all the time and the insights. Thank Welcome. you very much. Nice to, nice, to nice to meet you, Altab. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.